Welcome to a fresh take on the news, putting you at the centre of the national conversation about the issues that matter to you most. Tonight, the spending squeeze bites as house prices reach a record high. There's a warning, the worst is yet to come for food prices. Energy bills are rocketing and tax increases are on the way. I'm Trevor Phillips and this is The Great Debate. Each week, we get to the heart of the issue dominating the headlines. Tonight, with a Prime Minister battling to stay in his job and the cost of living soaring, our viewers panel from across the country will tell their stories. They'll have their say and hold our studio guests to account. And with us tonight, Bill Bullen, founder and CEO of Utilita Energy. Comedian and anti-poverty campaigner, Lucy Beaumont. The entrepreneur and businessman, Piers Linney and former Conservative MP and Economic Secretary to the Treasury, Justine Creening. And the big question facing us all tonight, broke Britain, can you afford the cost of living crisis? Everything seems to be going up, and it's not going up one or two pence, it's going up 20 pence, 50 pence. I would sooner have the heating on than I would have something to eat. A weekly shop for our groceries is increasing by between 15 and 25 percent. For me to stand here and pretend we don't have to adjust to paying higher prices would be wrong and dishonest. The national insurance rise to help pay for the NHS and social care is on the way. It just feels like it's always the people that are worse off that are hitting the pocket. Families in Britain will be still paying hundreds of pounds more for their energy. What can we do about it? Nothing. As always, we'll start with our viewers' panel, so let's go to the wall. Mark Hill in Sirencester, can you tell us your experience? Yeah, um, I'm married, my wife's disabled. I've worked at the same job for 22 years. Uh, my hip went back in July 2020, so I can't work at the moment. Um, I had to deal with it, not being able to go to work, not being able to walk properly, being in pain, um, lockdown, rising bills, and now depression. Um, I went on to Universal Credit when my sick pay ran out. It's the first time I've ever done it. Um, the first thing that happened was I had £80 taken away from me, um, which was a surprise. I've used up all my savings just to get through paying the bills um, until I could get used to what I'm doing. I've cancelled a lot of subscriptions. Uh, I've even cancelled a couple of payments that I used to do to charities because I can't afford it. Uh, I've sold a lot of the things that I've built up over the years. I've sold just to get money in. Um, unfortunately, my gas supplier and electric supplier was one of the ones that went into administration. So my bills have gone from 60 to 160 pound. We don't put the heating on at all. We keep the heating off. Um, we use the washing machine once a week. We keep the lights off as much as possible um, to try and save electric and money. It's the gas that's the biggest problem. The gas is higher because we've got a gas cooker as well. So the gas is costing us more. I'm not so much worried about myself, although I'm suffering from depression because of it. I'm worried about my family and where we're going to be in the future. Mark, thank you for sharing that with us. Let's go to Celia Hensman. Celia, do you want to tell us your I, experience? Well, I also have a disability. Um, and my, my greatest concern with the cost of living is, on average, it's about £583 extra a month it costs to have a disability. So that covers costs of additional heating, prescriptions, whether you need to take extra public transport to get to your appointments. One in five people who have a disability pay over £1,000 extra a month than the average person because of their disability. What is this additional cost of living going to do to disabled people and what can we do to protect them when they are already paying much higher cost to live in society than the average person? 
Let's go to Fife, where Mark Bennett has a question for our panel. Mark. <clears throat> Hi, thank you very much. Yes, I do have a question. It's a, it's a quite simple one. Um, with everyone's uh, bills that are going up um, in all the sorts of, of ways and everything, how comes, how comes the government seems to want to just blanket everybody and tarnish, you know, give everybody exactly the same? when there are clearly people like myself who are in a very fortunate position that that extra money that they're going to give me for the bills, for, for the electricity and the heating, I don't actually, I don't actually need it. Uh, I don't personally need it. I would rather it go to someone like the other Mark um, who needs the money, you know. I'm, I'm mm. OK. I live in an affluent uh, village. I live in an affluent place. Um, I've got money. You know, I've, I've worked all my life. I'm, I'm now retired. I sit on my backside and do bugger all. Um, <laughs> but, you know, surely someone... OK. In a, you know, as Lucy would say, yeah. someone in St John's Grove in Hull, they would need a hell of a lot more money than, than I would need. OK, Mark, thank you very much for that really interesting point, which has got some support from our wall. So, panel, question there from Mark is, why isn't the government giving targeted support to those who need it the most instead of blanket handouts. Justin Greening, when you were in government, this might have been a question for you. Why, yeah, I, and I'm not? obviously not in government now. I think the challenge is getting that balance right, especially when the cost of living rises are affecting everyone. And I think that was one of the concerns that people have, that actually a lot of families, not just those at the if you like, facing the most challenges already. This is now catching the mainstream of many, many people who are facing a challenge of maybe several hundreds, probably a thousand plus pounds plus tax rises. So I think it is hard to get that balance right. My sense is actually there does need to be more targeting. And I think one of the challenges the government's got itself into is that a lot of these changes have been late in the day, so they've been overlaid one on the other, mm. one on the other, one on the other. So you've ended up now with things pulling in different directions. Some measures the government wants to take that are meant to be targeted, and it's trying to do that directly through energy bills, it's trying to do it directly through councils, but that's not always working effectively. Then, setting aside that, were plans already in place to raise taxes? I think what it now needs to do is probably step back and decide how it wants to simplify that, because I think a lot of people don't actually know necessarily what support is there for them or where to get it, and it's complicated. OK. There's some support there from Justine for the idea of targeting, and there's some uh, support f uh, from our wall here. Piers Linney, what do you think? Do you agree that the current measures are maybe too uniform? So, I mean, in an ideal world, you get the exact right amount of money to the right person. The thing about government and having been involved in government and distributing funds out to businesses across the UK is that they need mechanisms that can work very, very quickly. So what they tend to do is use the systems that are already there because implementing new ones would take too long. But I think the problem is, is that we're always talking about the average person in the average situation, on the average earnings, in the average place. Most people are going to suffer aren't the average person. It's the edge cases, the people that Mark was talking about. So we've got to find ways of targeting and directing the resources we've got more accurately at those people, which is not easy to do, but we need some more thought about how we do that. Uh, Lucy Beaumont, um, we know you as a comedian, but also you're an anti-poverty campaigner. What do you make of this idea that we should target measures more? For, for me and, and the, 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 the charity work that I've done in, in the last few years, um, for the people that need it the most, there isn't time to talk. <laughs> there isn't time to think. These, are, this isn't something that this, this is a. This needed to be a lifeline. This needed to be an emergency package. In the way it was an emergency package when we bailed out big business, this is an emergency package. We're not. Of, of course, there's going to be middle income that might struggle. You know, they might keep the hot tub off. Uh -huh. You know. You know, you might, they might go to Aldi and not Waitrose. But what, what I think a lot of people, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are worried about what's keeping me awake at night, is, is the families where okay. this, this, is, this, is the, this is the choice between a mother feeding her kids and thinking, I can't feed the kids, I'm going to have to go on the game tonight, 
This is them saying, I have to stay with my abusive partner because I, I can't afford to move. This, this is saying, I live with a disabled child and I can't afford to keep the heating on and he needs the heating on. This is a lifeline. I, I'm, I'm, I'm devastated. I'm so angry We're at this stage. I really okay. am. But, Lucy, the government does say that they are handing a lifeline. They are handing out loans for uh, council tax. They are doing something on the energy, it's, uh, it's, 150 quid. Because they never got to the root problem, because, because austerity was so harmful, they are so far away. What they do not understand is you're talking about families that have multiple problems. It's so complicated. It, the, the way to, to get... And, and it's not okay. that... The thing is, local councils know how to help their communities. Okay. They don't have the resources and the funding to do it. It all, right. all comes down to, to not having enough money to do the things... All right, let, let's do. come back to the wall. I, I want to talk to Rose Mulenga Buckle. I've started questioning myself, who am I working for? Because if I can't afford, Trevor, to have heating in my house, food is expensive... Uh, petrol is expensive, and we are talking about national insurance being increased. What am I living for? Who am I working for? Am I a government machine to make money for the government without warming my house? I mean, I'm from Africa myself. I cannot afford, Trevor, to have no heating. So my question to the panel is, who are we working for? And what is the purpose of me living in England if I can't feed myself? Bill Bullen. That's pretty heartfelt. Yeah. Who is she working for? It's a tough question. I mean, you know, on this question of uh, energy price rises, I mean, obviously that does hit everybody. Um, but as Piers was saying, you know, we don't have such a thing as an, an average consumer and it's low-income households who are already struggling, have been struggling this year. I mean, for example, I think over this, just this winter that's just gone, we've been helping something like 2,000 customers every day on f with some kind of financial assistance. So they're struggling now. We're going to put energy prices up. Obviously, we've also heard about food prices and other basic commodities going up. I don't know what the effective um, inflation rate is for low-income households, but it's, it's way more than 7.5%. Well, you're and at, at 13... Uh, the, the lowest decile, the, the lowest 10 income 10% of the country spends 13% of their income on energy compared exactly. to 4% at it's, it's the top. Up, so their inflation rate is driven pretty strongly. I mean, what she's saying is that she feels like, frankly, she's working for you, not for her. I wouldn't say that she's working for me because I think, um, as everybody knows, energy companies aren't making money at the moment. With the price capping regime that we've had in place, most energy companies have been losing money for several years now. That's certainly the case for us. So... Um, I, I do sympathise. Um, I also feel like we spend most of our time working for the government as well. So. Justine, um, you heard what Rose had to say, and there's a lot of support there on, on the wall for her sentiment that actually all of this is working for somebody else who's making a lot of money somewhere else while she's paying out. Yeah, and I think it's why you come back to this fundamental discussion about how we want to target support. Um... Certainly, when I was growing up, my family was one of those that was in that situation of, like, trying to work out how much time we could have our heating on versus the rest of our bills. My mum and dad had to add up what they were going to go to buy at the supermarket before they left the house to make sure they had the money to be able to do that, because it would have been embarrassing if they'd put more in their basket than they could afford. So... I think it is really hard, and it fundamentally comes down to a question of how much do we want to tax working people... And what do we want to do with the benefit system and where are the lines that we're drawing in our society about being able to live with dignity and getting that balance right? I want to come back to the... We'll talk about national insurance and all of that in a moment. Before we do that, I, w I want to talk to Joshua Thompson-Smith. I'm um, an in professional engineer. I graduated um, five years ago and have been in professional work for that period. And I live in an area that um, is kind of a, a tale of two halves. You've got a lot of people with disposable income and that disposable income feeds local business, local pubs, local cafes. But you've also got the town of Burton-upon-Trent where it's going to be profoundly impacted. Um, it's the difference between heating your home 
or having a hot meal. And for me, that's, that's pretty hard to see as a, as a young voter, someone that's voted in three general elections. Um, I don't see it as acceptable personally. And when you look at this country uh, and you think about what we're doing fiscal policy-wise, why are we not looking towards the big corporations? Why are we not looking towards the higher earners? Why are we going for national insurance rises, squeezing the young earners, uh, the younger earners through student loan threshold freezing? Why are we looking at not trying to cap energy even more? Um, and for me, it brings me to the question of, is this government more interested in actually protecting the voters for the next general election, such as the grey pound, you know, that the voters are more liquid cash? Are they more interested in partying in number 10 because of okay. the young voter? That's what I see. Um, or are they actually interested in leading this great nation and these great people who are on this panel and in this audience through the next crisis? Joshua, thank you. Um, Piers Linney. Politics. Is politics getting in the way and getting into a situation where essentially what Josh is talking about, the slogan people use these days is heating or eating? So I think Josh made an important point there that it is a great nation. And we're supposed to be this, you know, whether you're for Brexit or not, I wasn't particularly. We're supposed to be this great nation, which we are, with a fantastic opportunity. But the issue is, is you know, politics typically is looking at the next election, which isn't even five years away now. So making decisions in that time frame, given where we are, doesn't really work. We need to look beyond it. And we need to turn this around and really stop talking about, you know, we've got to talk about the issues, but how do we solve it? How do we get out of it? In my view, it's all about growth. And it's taking people like Joshua, you know, who've put the hours in, they're educated, want to get into the economy, and actually making a difference and creating some wealth and some value. Because oh. you've either got to increase incomes or reduce costs. We can't do both. Well, OK, we're, we're going to get to that point eventually, but there's another part of this equation. Prices are going up, but incomes are going down. Coming up next, tax hikes on the way. But how much extra will you have to pay? The planned rise to national insurance will go ahead in April, according to the government. It's not what anybody wants to do. It's not what Richie wants to do. It's not what I want to do, but we've got to do it. It's needed. It really, really is needed for the industry. The wrong tax at the wrong time. It's not just the employees that are going to have to pay more. We're going to have to make a larger contribution as well. Which has always been at Sandringham, obviously last year because of the uh, pandemic last year, sort of talking about January, she wasn't there uh, because of lockdown. But it's always reflective. Uh, we've got to remember that 70 years ago that she came to the throne. Incidentally, 70 years ago today, she arrived back in the UK from, uh, uh, from Kenya. And I remember the death very well. I'm, I'm of that age. I was 11 years old when uh, the news came. We were sent home from school. Uh, when there was no internet, there were no mobiles, there were no email. The news was got by word of mouth or on the radio. And we had three uh, uh, evening papers, the first coming out at lunchtime and others later in the day. So it was the lunchtime papers that broke the news. And people were actually tearful. Uh, and it, it, it was the sign of the times. But for the Queen, it is reflective. You've got to remember, too, that this is the first year without Prince Philip. So it's a double reflection for her, her mentor, her father, and her strength and stay, her husband of 73 years. We've seen it on previous Jubilees, on the Golden in 02, 77, the silver, and who can forget the the, plat the uh, diamond in uh, 2012 with that uh, appearance on the balcony with very few royals, Prince of Wales, Duchess of Cornwall, uh, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, and Prince Harry, unmarried at the time. So yes, she is looking forward to it, and I hope that her private staff secretary will organise her, her time between now and then very, very carefully, maybe one or two engagements. She's one of these people that's always said, I have to be seen to be believed, and she wants to be seen, not on television, not on, uh, on, on virtual, but she wants to be seen in person. And I hope we are going to see her between now and the big celebration in June, which is four days, and I think everybody's looking forward to it and everybody's beginning to prepare for it.
Lama dalam komase liga ini, yoku yoku tebu beri amna ini koci. Welcome back to the great debate where we're talking about broke Britain and asking, can you afford the cost of living crisis? What happens when tax increases hit in a couple of months? In April, national insurance will go up both for employers and employees, meaning less take-home pay. And that could have a real impact on small businesses. Uh, an example, the one owned by Amanda Coleman, who is going to talk to us now. Amanda, how are you going to cope with this rise? Well, it's going to be really difficult because um, I started the business back in March 2020 and was never eligible for any kind of aid or support um, right the way through the pandemic. I spent the, well, coming up to two years um, and this last year, I've just about started to, to get to a really uh, good position. I'm looking to growth, but actually... I'm not going to now. I'm now potentially going to be in a position where I'm just about making um, making making ends meet and, and surviving. Um, so it's going to be a, a, a difficult time ahead. Crikey, you absolutely had really bad luck with the, the timing on that. Um, have you got a question for our panel? I have. It is, how can small businesses survive the national insurance increase? OK, thank you very much, Amanda. A question for our panel is, how can small businesses survive the national insurance rise? Piers Linney, you deal with a lot of small businesses, support some. What are you telling the people that you invest in? Well, I invest in them, but also I've got a business that supports small businesses. So, fantastic that you started a business during the pandemic. These people forget is that if you've got an income, a salary, costs are going up, so you're, you're being, your disposable income is being squeezed. If you've got a small business and your, your costs are going up, your margins being squeezed, you pass it on to your customer, that's inflation. But often, you're probably just being squeezed in the middle because you can't pass on those price increases. So your income actually is also under threat. So you've got a pincer movement, you're in a worst case scenario. If you've got a salary, you can lose your job potentially. But if you've got a small business, you're finding that Cop prices are going up, your income's going down. And the only way you can really do that is to, you know, I mean, people say this is you need to go through your entire, every line of management accounts and work out how can I reduce it, take it out. And the thing about the UK is we are suffering, uh, well, and this is well documented, from a lack of productivity. What we need to do is become more efficient and try and rinse out the opportunity we can with the resources we've got, but, which are dwindling. But, but, but what, what does somebody like Amanda do? I mean, I... Uh, I don't imagine that there's that much fat to cut in her business. Well, I was, uh, you've got two options, Amanda, haven't you? You've got one is to grow. One is to sort of, you know, I think 77% of small businesses are in a, a sort of, they're in stasis, really. They're not expecting to grow. And 44, we did some research about even your mental health, 65% are concerned they're going to grow out of business. So you've either got to stay where you are and try and keep your powder dry. You can grow, which is what everyone wants to do or you have to reduce costs. But the only way out of this, and I'm sure we'll come back to this, is to try and survive and then grow. Absolutely. One of the things I want to do is grow. Small businesses are the heart of communities. And without small businesses, you know, you're taking another ass thing away from people. Um, so, it's yes, it's something I want to do. I think the difficulty is I'm really just looking at getting my head down to survive um, over the next 12 months. OK, let's go to um, Robin Gillingham, um, Robin in Devon. Um, Robin, uh, you've been with us before. Hello again. Uh, I hope Night Christmas is good to you. What, uh, what advice would you be giving to anybody who has to deal with this uh, one and a quarter percent rise in national insurance contributions? Um, yeah, I mean, business and employees are all feeling the um, pinch uh, at the moment. Um, personally, I don't think we can just blame inflation on the household and business finances. Uh, yes, inflation is happening, but if we look deeper, you can also see how our society has changed. Uh, for example, the subscription culture that never used to be around 10 to 20 years ago. Uh, they're easy to sign up to with seven-day free trials and a click of a button. Um, but these soon add up and sometimes it's not e um, easy or even possible to cancel uh, when you need them to. Robin, just, just to be absolutely clear, though, 
You do yeah. think that we need to raise this money for health and social care, do you or not? The, yes. the, the yes. National Insurance Rise is supposed to deliver 12 billion quid a year for health and social care. Do you think we need that money yeah. or don't we? Yes, I do. Justin Greening, um, Robin says, get rid of your subscriptions, though not Sky subscriptions, everybody. <laughs> uh, that we could do more ourselves. I think there'll be a lot of people going through their household finances working out where they can save money across the board, to be honest. And, and I think this is the challenge in a way, because if you don't have that demand in the economy, then that has a knock-on impact on jobs. So that's the big risk as you get into this downward spiral where there's less money being spent and therefore there are fewer jobs because there's fewer jobs, there's less money being spent. And so uh, at some stage, what I would like to see is a much longer term plan from ministers because there's a challenge today, but fundamentally the seeds of why people are suffering now is 10, 20 years ago when you're coming through the education system, you're not getting the education you want, you're not in a position to get some of those higher skilled jobs. And we have to at some point tackle today, but we've got to break that cycle that we've had forever in Britain, which is where you start in life tends to shape where you end up. If you start behind, you finish behind. And that's what we've got to change. De I de I def yeah, I totally agree. But there's also been, in the last few years, some absolute draconian measures that have been put in by the government that haven't worked and haven't saved money. And my mind are almost criminal, the devastation they've called, the benefit sanctions, the bedroom tax, well, we're the, the, the shake-up of universal credit. You know, the, 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 even just the closures of libraries, like sometimes the only lifeline people have got to get information and get internet. It, 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 so this, these are the reasons why some of our most m most vulnerable Lucy, communities are, are, are in problems. We're not talking about obviously like Lucy. That, that's an incredibly popular view on on our war, but uh, and in fact we'll talk to a government minister a little later in the program. But but this is do, why don't, when we're don't you think we ought to we could be doing more ourselves, as uh, Robin Gillingham was saying. I, I, my, I mean, my, my particular interest is. Is, is in working with the most vulnerable and then working up because we haven't really got a society unless we've, we've sorted that out first. Okay. I just feel to be in this mess now, to be punishing people like this, when they've caused so many problems, okay. it, it, the, the meagre amount of money they're offering is, 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 is like, it's like throwing bread to ducks. Well, we'll test that out in a moment because after the break, Energy Minister Greg Hands will be joining us to talk expensive bills green taxes, and how the government's planning to help with the cost of living crisis.
You're watching The Great Debate, where this week we're talking broke Britain. Can you afford the cost of living crisis? And a big part of the pressures facing many people is a rise in energy bills, set to go up nearly £700 a year from April. The government's announced a £200 discount to try to help, but is that enough? Well, let's ask the Energy Minister, Greg Hans, who's with us. And uh, we're going to start with a question from Zubair Khan in Birmingham. Zubair, you've got a question for our panel and for our minister. Thank you. Um, good evening, panel. The cost of living crisis is going to have a disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable and poorest people in our society. And my question to the energy minister is, what more can be done to help people with rocketing energy prices? Thank you very much, Zubair. Um, so, his que Zubair's question is, what can be done to help people with rocketing energy costs? Greg Hans, um, what will you tell Zubair Khan when you see him on the doorstep? Well, what I'd say to Zubair is this, that the issue of rising energy prices and rising cost of living prices is very much on the government's agenda. That's why uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer announced a £9 billion of support last week. We've got to recognise that energy prices are rising due to global situations, uh, what's going on between Russia and Ukraine. There's other reasons why global energy prices are going up. Britain is not uh, immune from those global price rises. Uh, but that's why we've announced uh, £9 billion of support, £450 uh, for many households, most households in the country uh, overall. Um, there's also support coming through, like the rise in the national living wage. Um, there's changes in the universal credit taper rate that will provide support for people. So actually, there's a lot of government support coming through, but whilst recognising we can't be immune... Uh, from these global forces driving up energy prices. All right, let me come back to uh, the, our studio. Let's stay there for a moment. Bill Bullen, is that enough? Do you think that's going to be make a big difference to your more vulnerable, poorer customers? I think the short answer has to be no, I'm afraid. Um, when we did give this feedback to the government last week when we first heard about these, this package of measures. Um, first of all, the £200 is just a loan. Um, we have customers that can't afford their energy now. We're about to put their energy prices up, so I really don't see how they ever get to pay that money back. And, you know, obviously, everybody's getting the £200 as well, so it's, it's just not targeted enough. Um, you know, we think the government could have come up with, you know, about... A, the package size of the package seems to be about right, but it's just not targeted enough on low-income households, who we said earlier on, are facing a really disproportionate rise in their cost of living, and consequently, we're going to see some real hardship next winter. We're seeing real hardship now, and next winter, it's going to be a lot worse. It's going to be worse. Millions more households. Millions more households. Greg Hans, um, that is pretty bleak, isn't it? The boss of an energy company says the help you're giving... And nine million is a big number, but for the individual person, they're only seeing a few hundred quid, and some of that is a loan. It really doesn't cut it. Well, it's not all a loan, and the loan is there to provide the assistance up front when it's most needed. Uh, obviously, the council tax rebate for those living in properties uh, bands A to D, so are the less expensive properties throughout the country, uh, that is a one-off. That is a one-off payment that won't be repaid. And that comes in as early as April. So some of the support is repayable. Some of it uh, won't be repaid. But all of it will be paid this year when people are facing uh, the increase in bills, particularly the rises in energy bills, as I say, driven by global forces. Zubair Khan in uh, Birmingham. What are you thinking? Bill Bullen says not enough. Greg Hans says it will make a difference. What do you, what's your view? Well, I think I'll go with the um, uh, view that any financial shop is really appreciated by the most vulnerable and needy people in our society. As it's already been mentioned, the £200 is allowed, so somewhere down the line where people have to pay that back. So I think there should be much more targeted support mechanism in place for people to access. This blanket approach is not suitable in my view. Um, because there are people in 
certainly in society will not need that amount and that can be redirected to the people who really, really need it to help them uh, to decide whether to heat or uh, heat their home or buy food. Zubair Khan, thank you so much. Let's, let's go to another uh, member of our viewers panel, Patricia Harvey. You've heard the discussion here. What do you make of it? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Um, I think we should actually scrap or even delay the green transition. Ooh. This funding that's going into reaching the, should I say, net zero by 2050 should be diverted into helping people afford the imminent rising costs. Yes, uh. I know I'm probably killing polar bears, but I like my comfort and I think we all need to have a comfortable standard level of living. Greg Hans, you're uh, favouring well, polar bears over people. Let's, let's delay the net zero pledge. No, I, I, I completely disagree with that. Actually, um, uh, I totally respect the question, uh, but actually, we need to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, and the way to do that is by building our renewable energy capacity. We've had big success in this country. We're a world leader in this space. For example, we've got the world's largest installed offshore wind capacity. The amount of our electricity that's been uh, 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 coming from renewables has gone up from 7% of the energy mix to 43%. Okay. It's a big success, but it reduces our dependence on these volatile imported okay. fossil fuels. So we're less dependent on the global gas price, okay. more dependent on our domestic renewables. All right, Patricia Harvey, uh, what do you um, think of what Greg Hans has to say? Look to the future, he says. Yes, look for the future, but I'm talking about now. I'm talking about the current climate now. I'm talking about dependent <coughs> families, people that cannot afford with these fossil fuels and these wonderful energy that's coming. I'm talking about now and the families and the, should I say, elderly people who are struggling now. We need help now. £200 is nowhere near when the average fuel bill is £700 plus this year. People just cannot afford this. They are, there are struggling families out there. OK, thank you, Patricia. Lucy? Yeah, I, I, I would just like to know, what is the reason to give to support to people that don't need it? What, what is the reason? Why, why, I'm, you know, I, I, I work in TV. Why do I need £200? I don't, I don't need it. Why, why, couldn't, why couldn't that be going to people that do need it? What is the reason? Because even the, even the amount that's going to be given to local authorities still isn't enough. I, I would really like to know what is the reason you aren't giving more support to the people that need it the most? Greg Hans, well, this is an interesting point. Well, Nobody say spend more, but why not spend on the people who most need it? Well, we are giving that support. The £150 council no, but her, tax her rebate... Her point is... The, the point that's being made here is you're giving a lot of money to a lot of people for, to whom it's not going to make much difference. You, well, that's the why? repayable... Well, uh, OK, first to note, that is the repayable part of the programme. It's get repaid over five years. The amount of money that is being given as a rebate, uh, the council tax rebate, for example, goes to those in bands A to D properties, i.e. the less expensive properties... We also have the existing schemes, the Warm Homes Discount, uh, which is a levy on better off fuel payers. And that Warm Homes Discount now going to £150 is going to less well, well off uh, bill payers. So there already is quite a lot of redistribution in the system. I want to come back to the wall and talk to Chris Taylor. Chris, uh, I think you have a view about this debate that we're having essentially about targeting or re redistribution? Well, I wanted to ask about the rise in the energy price cap. Um, with the possible exception of the rail network, it seems that the energy sector is the biggest single failure of this dogmatic application of market forces to the provision of public services and utilities. Consumers are constantly berated to seek out these alleged better deals, comparing ludicrously complex plans and tariffs that, frankly, no one understands. At the behest of what looks increasingly like the cartel of energy providers. Bill Bullen, 
you are part of a cartel that Definitely is essentially not. robbing the people. Definitely not. Um, I absolutely want to put the mind at, at ease that the energy business is not a cartel. We're all very different, um, and that's the benefit of, of having an open market. A company like mine is you know, very focused on the prepay market sector. I think we've innovated hugely, introducing smart prepay, you know, really bringing prepay into the 21st century. You know, I don't think we'd have had that if we'd have had just a, you know, one state or, or just a, a simple cartel of companies. So now, I, you know, I've been in the energy industry actually since the 80s. So, you know, it's, it's much more efficient now. It's much more dynamic. Um, so, you know, and delivering, I think, for consumers. Obviously, yeah. what we can't do anything about is the cost of wholesale, which is, you know, the big problem that we're all dealing with at the moment. All right. There's one thing I'd like to add is that what we're missing here is that, you know, there's 13 million people employed by small businesses in okay. the UK. They don't get any help. All right. This is the great debate. Up next, who or what is the answer to the cost of living crisis? We need to get this country moving at top speed again. We're going to level up. My government will level up. We are serious about wanting to level up. This is a government in free fall, out of ideas. Have a windfall tax on oil and gas companies and cut those bills. This is the real testing point for the government, really, to start delivering. I'm Stuart Ramsey, and I'm Sky's chief correspondent. Well, there's a real sense now that people are beginning to expect that this whole airlift is coming to an end, and they're really, really desperate. We saw snatch squads going in, grabbing people and putting them into trucks. You either live and recover, or you die. OK, so that's like a war. That's the war, yes. Yeah. We help you understand the world with us. Over the past 24 hours, the soldiers have been attacked on a number of occasions. It's really sending a clear message that Venezuela is eager for change. We've been crushed. To take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. They were convinced the United States would become hooked. Well, we're right. Well, Norman's explosion has just come down. I think it was a monster that just landed in between us. The information on this could bring down the entire network, not just in Iraq and Syria, but across the world. It's not out of control, but it's big withdrawn. It's so, oh, so hot. because I get to do something that is contributing to a better future.
Welcome back to The Great Debate. Tonight, we're asking if you can afford the cost of living crisis. Of course, the reality is that we don't have a choice. Prices are going up. So let's go straight to our viewers panel. Let's talk to Will Leyland about how he plans to manage this. Will. Hey, it's, uh, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm a father too. We've got another on the way um, in June. Um, so my partner's going to be going on a maternity leave in March. So we're going to see a drop in our income from that. But I, I do relatively okay. I'm not on a low income, so um, relatively speaking, we're okay. But in April, I've got national insurance is going up. My gas and electric fixed deal is going to come to an end. I expect the council tax might probably go up as well. Um, and the cost of food and petrol recently has been going up really, really fast. It's something that I've really noticed and really um, paid attention to. They're also expecting inflation to exceed 7% in the spring. Um, I also pay back student loans as well. Um, and I've, I've thought about reconsidering um, the possibility of buying a house in the next year or two, because I think that the Bank of England are more than likely going to have to rise um, the base interest rate to tackle this rise in inflation. So there's a lot, potentially... there's an awful lot going on for you. What, what's your question for our yeah. panel? So my question um, is, is there a solution to at the cost of living crisis. <clears throat> OK, question for our panel. Is there a solution to the cost of living crisis? Lucy, what would you advise Mr Johnson and his colleagues? Step down and let a Labour government come in. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to okay, spend that's some not gonna, money. I think we should have that, a Labour that's government. That's not going to happen. That's, well, I'm going to say that's not going to happen I tomorrow. Think we should but have a centrist Labour what, government. What should any government do about this? Because whatever the colour of government, they're going to face the same problem, aren't they? I mean, we, we were just talking now about the... I mean about the windfall tax, where we, you, you, that, the two sides and the... That you, well, you, you will explain it better, won't you? I agree. The key yeah. thing is we must not lose sight of, you know, what the long-term goal has got to be. I, mean, I understand this next year is going to be really tough on the whole economy, but we were talking earlier on about, um, you know, moving away from environmental taxes and, and not concentrating on net zero. We absolutely mustn't do that. Piers made the key point, I think, earlier on, is that the whole economy has got to get more efficient. That's, you know, absolutely essential. Um, and, you know... The point about the windfall tax is, you know, if we want an economy, if we want Britain to be a place where, you know, companies are going to be come here to do business, which is, you know, how we grow out of this problem, okay. then um, we have to have a, a stable fiscal regime. Companies have to trust the Chancellor. All right. Justin Greening, we've, well, we've heard two things tonight. Just heard about the windfall tax. Earlier we heard, let's go slow on net zero. Have you got anything else that you could offer? Well, so I think... Bill's right, you, you do ultimately need to fix some of these long-term issues, which is why people find themselves trapped in low-paid jobs and they're not able to move up the ladder. So part of that is education. But I think business has a big role to play on this. A, a lot of the work that I'm doing is around getting bigger businesses in particular to really think more strategically about how their opportunities change lives and how they can be more proactive in putting them into communities that need them, how they can be more activist on genuinely making sure that people are skilled up to get those opportunities that are out there, especially this new economy with net zero and, and green jobs. We have to make sure that they're having an impact in the parts of the country that perhaps haven't had as many opportunities. Oh. But I think at the end oh. of the day, it's mad that you've got something like an apprenticeship levy that is there to help upskill and reskill people, and it's so tightly drawn oh. by ministers that half of it apparently had to be given back to the Treasury. It's things like that that you could change right now that would allow businesses to play more of a role themselves in helping people connect up to jobs that are already there. And All it's right. mad that we're in a situation where okay. business has a skills gap People are desperate to earn yeah. more money and we can't make a connection between... All right, the two. so we're hearing about net zero, we're hearing windfall tax, we're hearing businesses can do a bit more. But actually, you mentioned other parts of the country and the phrase of our time is levelling up. And I think uh, Vasiliki uh, Kontu uh, Watson has a view about levelling up. Good evening. Yes, I think... Uh, Michael Gore would certainly advocate uh, that this is the solution. His, his latest white paper on levelling up 
However, that does not seem to be the, the case, especially in Sunderland. I do feel that the government has let Sunderland down um, with this level of agenda. Um, I think things are getting worse, to be honest, and, and I can see on a, on, a, on a daily basis that people are losing their jobs. I know parents who are, are struggling to put food on their table. Children are going to school uh, without, um, you know, with, without enough food. Uh, businesses are, are closing. So really my question would be, you know, why aren't local councils investing in helping families with living costs okay. when, okay. especially in Sunderland, uh, you know, we, we've got a, a, a right. massive bout of uh, millions okay. been invested in major recreation, housing, entertainment projects. Okay, thank you, Vasiliki. Lucy Beaumont, um, it's, it's... this is an interesting point, isn't it? Yeah. We should invest in the things that Vasiliki is talking about rather than maybe big infrastructure. And they are, and, and the, the, the work I've been doing in uh, Halifax, Leeds, Hull, uh, councils are really involved. What we've got to remember, is, especially since, like, since 2000, take, take Blackpool, for, for instance, which is, I mean, what I'd like to do is if I was in government, you would move government to Blackpool. Whoa. And you would sort out Blackpool, and then the skills that you've learned from sorting out Blackpool, you then can you can sort anywhere out. It's somewhere like that. You know, you've got wards that 50% in po child poverty, 50% of the children in certain wards. Mm. Since 2010, they've lost over... I think it's getting to, like, £900 million the local council's lost. Okay. This is, we're still feeling the effects of austerity. Okay. Yeah, and, but the, the thing that people, I think people are aware, but government isn't aware okay. because it's so unseen the going without food. And okay, Lucy, you, you summoned up an incredible image of the glitter ball in the middle of Parliament. Piers, last point. Um, what about this levelling up thing? I mean, I grew up in the north of England, so you know, levelling up is a great idea. It's going to take a generation. I always say there's a, you know, ambition is not is sort of evenly distributed. Capital opportunity isn't. The government's got two major tools to deal with this. One is quantitative easing that drives inflation. The second one is now interest rates. So we're going to see those go up. The only way out of this, and you know, local authorities, a point made there, it's great, and you've got to look after the most vulnerable. But somebody somewhere has got to pay for it. So it's either taxation on a static economy with a low growth economy for some time. Now it's really about how, Bill's point as well, it's refer back to my point, is how do we as a nation grow out of this? That is the only answer. Can I say one thing? I am one, pretty sure. Can I say I'm one afraid, thing about that. We are, I'm pretty sure we're going to come back to this, but I'm afraid that's all we have time for this evening. And it just remains for me to thank our panellists here in the studio Piers Linney, Justin Greening, Bill Bullen, and Lucy Beaumont. But of course, it's you at home who are at the centre of this conversation. If you'd like to be part of the programme next time, get in touch by emailing us here at thegreatdebate at sky.uk. But for now, I want to thank everybody on our wall, on the viewers panel, who's contributed tonight. Thank you for your usual spirited presence. See you next time. And then you at home, keep talking. And we'll see you again at the same time next week for The Great Debate. Je suis allé commencer à faire des choses. Je suis allé commencer à faire des choses.